I just faded that out, is that right? Yes. Yeah, it's it's good fade, though. I've seen it. Sounds like you've done it before. Mm. Well, so we were in Studio 2 earlier and somebody asked us if any of us knew how to use Pro Tools. <laughs> <laughs> Is that still on? Did you stop that? By the way? It's still, it's still going. Still yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was Phil Harding, John Leckie, me, uh, oh, Tony we Harris, no. everyone, everyone there. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we went, yeah, I think we, from between us we could probably work it out. <laughs> Are you working? Yes, yeah, red light's on. We're cool. Okay. Rolling. I'm, I'm going to look at my mobile phone because I, in the last, clap, you want to clap? Please. Round of applause for John Leckie, please. <laughs> Can you, is, is that useful for sinking purposes? There's one on its own. <laughs> one has the sound of one hand clapping. So I'm going I'm to be looking at my mobile phone because during the last Taking five minutes since I got the brief on what we're meant Facebook. to be doing, I've, I've made some copious notes. So, um, so here we are. We're in Abbey Road, Studio 3. Yeah. I'm George Schilling and this is John Leckie. Um, and you started work here... In 1970. 1970. 1970, February 15th, I started here, yeah. Yeah. Ken Townsend gave me the interview and phoned me up a few weeks later and said, Can you start on Monday? So, yeah, and that's it. I haven't looked back. I haven't had a day off since. And you, and you got the job <laughs> based on your hair looking a bit like mine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They looked me up and down. I had me loon pants on and me Kensington Market t shirt and hair like that. And you got the job. <laughs> I'm still working on it. Because everyone else, of course, was in suit and tie and quite smart and stuff. I mean, there was a few other people young. I was 19, just coming up to 20 when I started. So, And, um, yeah, the funny thing was that on a Saturday, you see all these people in the, in the week, you know, with suit and tie on. But on a Saturday, they'd come in and they'd have a little roll neck jumper or a cravat or, you know, a polar neck on. So and sometimes when you see pictures of old Abbey Road session, you can see engineers that haven't got a suit and tie on. You go, I bet that was a Saturday, you know. <laughs> <laughs> was that because you could get away with it on a Saturday because there was nobody yeah. to tell you off for not looking smart? Or was That's it just, right, yeah. 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 <laughs> it wasn't even Gen the rules. Well, that... actually, there's a guy called Neil Richmond, apparently, who I, I took over his job and he got sacked because, um, what's the guy's name? Stag, Walter Stag was the manager before Gus Cook, before Stag was the manager. And he came in and um, Neil Richmond was the tape op doing a session in two, I think it was Pretty Things. And he'd taken his shoes off because it was like three o'clock in the morning or something. And he, was, he just had his socks on. And the manager walked in and go, where's your shoes? You're fired. <laughs> and sacked him <laughs> immediately for not wearing shoes on the session. And that's how I got his job. There's a top tip. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what was the job? Was it tape operator, T-boy? What was it? What was no, it no, called? it was tape operator. So yeah. I was employed as a tape op. I'd come from uh, Ravensbourne College of Art. I did a, a film and TV course called Moving Picture Communication. I thought it was a film college and I was going to come out of college and be a film director. And of course, that wasn't the way and I couldn't get a job and there was you had to be in the union and this kind of thing and so I worked in a little film company in the West End for a bit and just wrote to all the studios and um, Abbey Road gave me the job so that was it I haven't looked back really. How did you find out where to write to in those days there wasn't a you couldn't go on the internet and look it up could you? Looked in the phone book. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you accidentally write to a few fashion studios and photography studios? No, I worked, worked at work EMI out. Recording Studios, Decca, yeah. Broadhurst Gardens, Olympic, and that one in Portland Place, I, ICP, is it called? IPC? IPC. IPC, not IPC. IC, IPC, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there was only four or five studios. So. Oh, I see, right. It wasn't um, like the, the Music Week directory when I was trying to do it in the 1980s. <laughs> no, no, there was hardly any studio. But, um, so yeah, I got the job as a tape op, and basically my training was you sit there and watch, don't touch anything, and just watch what's going on. So I'm, try I'm off to ask what the first session was, and I think it was um, Procol Harum doing a, uh, the Salty Dog album in Studio 2. Um, engineers at the time would have been Peter Bowne, who taught me a lot, used to let me do things. The best thing about Pete Bowne is, Pete Bowne was, he'd been here since before the war. I think he, he, he got the job with um, Stuart Elton. The, the, the pop engineers were Peter Bowne and Stuart Elton. And there was a, a, quite a sharp division between 
pop and classical. I mean, they even had different EQs in the red mi in the, those mixers back mm. there. If it was a pop session, they'd put the pop EQ in, and if it was a classical session, they'd strap in there. Yeah, they were plug-ins, because yeah. you actually plugged them into the yeah. red desk there. Yeah. Um, and the, in the same way that the engineers, you know, classical engineers would never do a pop session, and pop would never do a classical session. So you mainly did the assisting on the pop sessions, did you? Though? Yeah. No, well, I did, did and classical. classical so well, you yeah. would basically do whatever you were put on. So mm. you might, for instance, be put on Pink Floyd, which, you know, I grabbed the chance to do any underground bands, you know. <laughs> I'd be on <laughs> them, you know, like a shot, like put my name down. And you could put your name down or you were told. Very often you were told to do... Uh, tape hop in on a classical session for instance in studio one which would have been chris parker i think lester talked about chris parker bob gooch the classical engineers classical producers and they were all recorded um i remember i did a series of as a tape hop a series of uh sir adrian bolt doing um uh beethoven symphonies for hmv uh in studio one and i think i spent the whole of 1970 mornings every morning tape hop in that and when I met Nigel Kennedy you know and uh, Nigel <laughs> and I told him I'd done this and Nigel was just like oh, oh man and, you know it was like you this is fantastic they were the greatest recordings ever of Beethoven symphonies which was done down there and they were all recorded stereo straight to stereo and you'd have two machines at that time we were actually running A62s which you don't see much now um, not A80s they were A62 Studers at 15 without Dolby yeah Dolby wasn't even invented in those days and you'd run two of them as a master and just log what movements the numbers on the score and what your timer was and then they'd come in for a playback and the first thing you learn on a classical session is not to cough during the playback because you know they all come in and there's playback and you might play a whole movement back so it might be a 20 minute playback you know mm. And you're sitting there and you're dying to go to the toilet or something or you're dying to cough <laughs> and you can't because everyone's like studying the scores and they so um so if they hear a cough they think it's on the recording they think it's yeah. on the recording yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then then you'd sometimes you do operas you know when they'd record four track on j37 opera which would basically be stereo orchestra and stereo voices so all the soloists and the choir would be on two tracks and the orchestra would be on another two tracks but recorded simultaneously oh yeah recorded simultaneously yeah and they would, would each performance. singer have it have their own mic move no the, the well, singers would they move moved. across yeah. the stereo yeah as per the instructions yeah. the stage instructions yeah. for the opera so yeah. the singers would move and it was all done it was more or less two straight stereos yeah but you had the option to mix you see and mixing involved putting the faders level and listening to the whole side that had been edited by the editors uh so there was a team down the side of the building there the the, the ramp down the studio one there's three rooms there i think they've now built a studio but they were three editing rooms and there were three guys there david bell was the the main editor and they were classical editors so there was so much classical work going on that you'd record it all in sections and bits and then the producer would give the editor the score and all the tapes and he would just edit according to the notes and you know um but before that of course there was a playback and one of the worst things for a tape op to be put on if you well if you're into the music it's one of the best but you, you'd have to you'll be put on a week's playback classical playback which would basically sit in with a classical producer and he'd go play me take 56 so you'd have to find take 56 spool it forward play take forward. now play me take 24 and you spooled it off and find it because no one else could touch the masters the only way of playing back was to play the master tape because there was no copies there was no cds there was no no cassettes you know it would mm. if you'd have a seven and a half copy it was mm. really the the playback thing um and so the only way the producer could hear the takes would be to have a, a playback and the mm. only person that could handle the tape was a, a qualified person mm. being the tape op so that that was often like you'd, you'd go up to Vera's room and she'd put you on a week or two weeks, nine till half past five of solo violin or something or some German woman singing or something for every day for two weeks. You'd do that. And then the next day you'd spend all weekend staying up all night with Pink Floyd or Edgar Broughton band or something, you know.
so yeah, you to do anything really, uh, which was great learning uh, experience. So you could record big orchestras, you could record rock and roll bands, and you could record um, Danny LaRue. Mm -hmm. If anyone knows who Danny LaRue is, they're off to the session. Yeah. Well, obviously, Lester's sort of told us all about the microphone collection here, and um, you, you obviously got to see people using them and and then sort of learn what they sounded like, presumably, from, yeah. from observing what mics people would use on different instruments. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Unlike, yeah. you know, and also we were saying earlier about how um, people sort of kept their secret sort of techniques, yeah. you know, whereas now we're telling everybody how you did it. That's so right. You, you wouldn't sort of share the information quite the same way in those days. No, no, it was kind of considered top secret really I yeah. mean it sounds a bit funny now but I remember when I first started doing interviews for magazines and stuff and they kind of go what microphones do you use on the drums and I'd say I'm not telling you that you know that's my trade <laughs> secret you know you don't you don't really share people you know that that's your trade secret your special yeah. special little se this secret weapon that you would get out you know I mean I know it sounds mad but things like putting the vocal through the Leslie I know bloody Jeff Emmerich did it with Tomorrow Never Knows but I didn't know that I didn't know that's how they got the vocal sound no. it was just a trick that I knew that at the back of a Hammond C3 there was a phono socket and if you got a XLR to phono and plugged the mic in and plugged it into this phono socket you could your voice came out the Leslie which was fantastic yeah you know and only you didn't tell anyone else that <laughs> <laughs> that was your trick. Well, I think yeah. even you know, even twenty or thirty years after that, it was still people were still quite secretive about things. And yeah. You know, and I've experienced. I was telling you about you know, a yeah. famous engineer who I went to have a look at the mixing desk and I was looking to see what all the knobs did, and he peeled off the the strip. Yeah. He thought so I was he, looking at what his EQs were. What his EQs? Were, yeah. <laughs> As if that was going to help me. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. But there are no secrets, are there now? No, not really, no. But no, then but you, it never comes out the same. There's no good point in saying this is the mic I use, I always use a D twenty and on a bass drum, but it doesn't mean to say you're gonna get a John Leckie bass drum sound just because no. you're using that mic or even reverbs or something. You know, mm. it's all a bit irrelevant really. Absolutely. I think when I first time I interviewed you or second time I interviewed you, I think I think must have interviewed you about six times now. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think I said, you know, I've just got a D a D nineteen C. If I put it over the drummer, will it sound like Ringo? And you said no, it will sound shit. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Because it's yeah. a crap mic. Yeah. <laughs> but you always see those photos of Ringo in here, don't you, with with the the D nineteen C hanging over his head? Yeah. If you ever see a picture of the Beatles in Abbey Road. That's yeah. That's what I used. That's right. Yeah, it sounds pretty good on the records. Well, it's because it's a robust moving yeah. core mic, and yeah. you know, I mean, Lester said about dropping the D nineteen, but um, they were they're a robust, ro yeah. like a fifty eight, really. I yeah. mean, you can throw it on the floor and swing it around and bash mm. it, and it's still going to work. <laughs> you can't do that with you can't do that. Well, you can do it with a fifty eight or a fifty seven. You can, you know, like Roger Daltrey, you can do that, but you wouldn't do it with an eighty seven or forty seven, would you? <laughs> yeah. after your blood if you did I know. <laughs> so you I gather your some a lot of your early sessions were actually in this room or in studio three that's right yeah we were going to talk about three the way it used to be well, so that have been, cause you, did you do some sessions with Mickey most as well you used to, you used to, yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Would that have been in here yeah usually in here yeah what was that what was, was he like then what was Mickey most was fantastic actually I learned a lot the thing I learned about from Mickey was about the song really forget about the engineering mm. and the sound and all that shit it's about the song and the vocal and the mix mm. it was fussy about the mix but mm. he'd bash it down I mean we're talking eight track and doing four songs in three hours with a 20 minute musicians union tea break and you've got to be ready to record at 10 and the drummer doesn't show up till five to ten so you know at five to ten the studio's empty session's going to start at ten and three minutes to ten everyone comes in Right, we're ready. <laughs> and you're late. <laughs> so you've got to be ready too, you know, and you learn how to do that. That's where your job is, and you don't fuck up, or else you don't get on, you get fired, or they don't ask you to do it again. And it's also a challenge, you know, to, to record 24 musicians mm. on eight track in four songs in three hours. And next week, it's Top of the Pops, literally. Next week, mm. Susie Quattro, boom, it's, it's number one, you know. So, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of faffing about with 
computers and mixing and all tuning and all that stuff. You just got great musicians and great vibe and did it all in here. So yeah, this room, this room, this area was quite different. This room wasn't even here. I mean, I don't know how many people know about this, but this, the control room, the whole studio was round the other way. The control room, that booth at the back was actually, it goes back further than that. And that was the control room. And the, to get in the control room, it was a door off of the reception. So the only way to get from the control room to the studio was to walk past the front door, all the Beatles fans at the front, past the commissioner who was the security guy and come in this side door. So, you know, every time there was a playback, the band would have to walk all the way around and have the playback and then walk all the way back again. Um, the studio was quite dead. It was, it was all acoustic tiles, <laughs> uh, low ceiling, acoustic tile, low ceiling. Um, and the interesting thing about that control room, of course, is it's the only room in Abbey Road that's got daylight. So the, the windows, if you go in that booth and just look, you'll see a little bit of a window and the, it's got an old frame, small window frame, because from the outside of the, when they built this room, they couldn't change the outside appearance of the building. So the window frame's the same. But you've got to remember the Beatles sat in there and their only access to the outside world was looking out of that window of people going over the crossing. So maybe that's how they got the idea of them on the crossing was because that's what they looked at all the time when they were in this studio. Um, and this studio, this, this room, so the studio ended probably right where we're sitting, I think. And this room uh was not really used the only thing that was there was always access to that door and there used to be the sound effects cupboard so the guy called Stuart Elton he he had the sound effects his his little thing was going out and recording trains going past and there was always a sound effects library but a lot of it was in mono and studio and Stuart and Alan Parsons as well doing money so Alan the the the, the money loop on money was Alan recording t uh, clocks ticking for the sound effects cupboard you know um, but you basically had a. <laughs> let's just laugh. And you remember, you said the sound effects covered here. So very often, you know, you'll be doing a, a, an album, and you go, "Hey, it'd be great to have the sound of seagulls, wouldn't it?" So you rush off to Stuart's sound effects cupboard and get this these things out. Um, you know, and a beat, of course, Sergeant Pepper's full of um, Abbey Road sound effects from that cupboard. Right. But right. this room here is interesting because it was there was a window there. And there was no window, it was just a door, so you couldn't see into this room. But there's some pictures going around that people might have seen of the Beatles with a Moog synthesizer, with a Moog synthesizer. And it's one of the big Moog, what they call 25s Moog now, uh, big Moog synthesizer. And I think it belonged to Mike Hug from Manfred Mann, because you got these pictures, and there's Jeff Emmerich standing. I think it's when Jeff Emmerich passed away, they kept showing these pictures of. Um, the Beatles with the Moog and Jeff sort of and Jeff and George Martin there mm. and Tony Clark sitting in the background and it's in this room right where all you lot are standing that's where it was yeah um and it, it was never an isolation room because there was no visual contact but the studio was completely around the other way and it was a TG desk like that originally it was uh, that color that's all i know about the color that kind of green color is a mark one i think is that the first one that green color yeah. and then it went to a black color and a wrap around a bit like it was then in two and we were one two and three at one time had all tg desks um when i started they it was all tg desks three m8 tracks uh studio j37s um lockwood speakers in uh, tannoy speakers in Lockwood cabinets, big Lockwood cabinets up on the shelf, which were really boomy. And in fact, overnight, because Mickey Most had said so, had been to America, every room in the building was changed from Tannoy to JBL. So no one consulted the engineers. No one said, hey, we're going to change the monitors in all the studios, <laughs> you know, even the cutting rooms and everything. It was, and they, they were changed overnight from Tannoy Lockwoods to JBL. So same J, what's at the back of Studio 2 there, you'll see the studio playback on either side of the, the back door there. Those, those speakers were in every room, in here, 
four of them in Studio 2 for Quadraphonic, four of them in Studio for all the mastering rooms, Chris Blair's room was all those Tannoy speakers. I don't know what they were powered with. Were they powered with 50 watt EMI 50 watt tube amps? Quad. Really? Oh, quad, quad 303s, quad 50s. 50 quad 50s. Quad 50s. They never went loud enough in, in here. You could do it in two because it was small, but the thing is, this is a very big control room and you played it loud to the bands. You know, mm. I mean, I'm rock and roll person you never you never listen to anything on small speakers until the ns10 came out really no no record was ever made overdubbed mixed or mastered on a little speaker until the ns10 until mm. the early 80s really so all those records that everyone goes wow they sound great in the 60s they're all done loud on big speakers and that's how you recorded you know yeah yeah, it was going on. And it was great, and it, you could hear what was going on, exactly, <laughs> and it was exciting. And when the band came in for a playback, it was well, that's a lot fucking of it crank well, it, it up, and yeah. it would be on the point, of, you know, as max as you could go before it started distorting. Before it started hurting. Yeah, and if you didn't like it, you went and stood at the back of the room yeah. or something. Yeah. But all those records, that's a big thing. It, it, it took me a long time to remember that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> was that it was all, everything was done loud on yeah. big speakers. Yeah. You did XTC in here? Yeah. You were telling me about they had a bit of a, a meeting with somebody in the corridor. Oh, yeah, Edward Heath. I did XTC <laughs> second album in here. I, was, I did the first album as well. We mixed in here. And Edward Heath, who was the Prime Minister, Edward Heath, was he was a, a choral conductor. He conducted choirs, loved all that. And he was down in Studio One. And um, this was a time of the Sex Pistols and stuff. And so XT, someone from Virgin came running and said, would, would Mr. Heath like to come and meet a punk rock band? He goes, oh, <laughs> yes, I'd love that. So at lunchtime, there was Edward Heath and his crew in with XTC. And I mean, we, they weren't Sex Pistols. They weren't like out of order or anything. But it was quite an interesting thing to yeah. have that. And Margaret Thatcher would come for a visit around the studios. And that, what was it that someone just said about the King? Yeah, what in? was what that was, conversation? Was that? <laughs> we're talking was to it Tony. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the king. Yeah, the king. King George VI. King George VI in Abbey Road. Yeah, yeah. Who, who mentioned that we, earlier? We got the mic. Beatrice Harrison. <laughs> Beatrice Harrison. Oh Jello yeah. And the Nightingale. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so what was the question? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time ago now. Yeah. <laughs> XTC. So was that recorded? That conversation with Edward Heath. Or it it was recorded, but it didn't come out very no. well because in the when when Studio Three was done up, when it had the Neve mixer, when they got rid of the TG. So um, 1974, I think we went to yeah, to uh, Neve, Neve. Went to Neve desk, which is now at Paul Epworth's the church. The Neve desk there. Um, it used to be here in three um and the first session was wish you were here was um pink floyd wish you were here on there and actually the night before the session was due to start on the monday and i don't know if lester was here but i i was i was on the session before barry Humph humphreys came in um because i'd known the floyd and worked with them for some time and they said oh can you do our next album it's like no, far off, you know. <laughs> it's like, yes, of course I'll do it. <laughs> so I was there. And the night before, the mixer hadn't even been turned on. It was all there, the uh, the new Neve desk, but it hadn't been powered up. And they plugged it in, and there was this deafening hum coming from everything. <clears throat> and everyone stayed up all night trying to get rid of the hum. <laughs> and I came in 10 o'clock the next morning, and they'd fixed it. Right. And then the Floyd turned up at 2, and... Off we went, shine on your crazy diamond, back in track, you know. Mm. <laughs> tape one. <laughs> um, but does that tape exist of Edward Heath and the XTC is what I, or, what I was getting at? No, I wiped it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't, no. No, no, no. <laughs> um, so, uh, Studio 3, yeah, this is it. Mm. It's great. Um, they ruined it when they did it up and turned it all round. I don't know why they didn't keep it the way it was, but... It was completely oblong. Yeah. With the phenomite or pegboard boards. Yeah, pegboard. It was very dead. It was very dead and never had any lighting. The lighting was all... The, Alan, Alan Brown did the lighting. Do you remember that lighting yes. on the ceiling? Andromeda. He had this, yeah, strange thing. Um, Out of planets. Yeah. Yeah. 
we still got that in the cupboard somewhere. Have you? Yeah. It was what would they, 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 that was six foot square, little um, perspex, perspex things. Yeah. Heads, different diameters. Yeah, they made this in their spare time. By the heavens and the Andromeda. It was an Andromeda. It was a galaxy, a spiral, galaxy. A spiral galaxy, all done with perspex little holes put in with a light behind it and they put it up on the ceiling so when you looked at it it was this spiral galaxy but it was really tacky it was really horrible <laughs> and that was, was what you had to look then. at it was the future yeah <laughs> this is 1974 wasn't it yeah. yeah um so things have changed a bit since then there's about a million channels on this desk there's a million channels yeah and then there's more mic preamps in the wall over there hundreds the of them yeah leave ones and all sorts going on and outboard we never had we did have outboard in three. The only outboard we had actually were Keypex and Game Brains mm -hmm. and Fairchilds and Outex. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, on the TG desk, you got compressors on every channel. So they kind of said, well, we, you don't need, you know, mm -hmm. what do you want limiters and compressors for? You've got Fairchilds. And did you have echo no. plates, EMT plates? and uh, Four EMT plates. And springs? And, no. No springs. springs, that's a bit low rent for no, heavy no right springs. Here. You had four EMT plates which you could patch around anywhere, but you also had three chambers. So each yeah. studio, there's chambers one, two, and three. And on yeah. the roof here, if you go up to the top floor and when you come to the top of the stairs, straight ahead of you is a door, which unfortunately is locked, but it was always left open. And you could climb out on the roof there. And on the roof is still there is a little, uh, a very short, a tiled room which is number three's chamber right number one's chamber was under the front of the house under what used to be room 42 yeah, it used to be the stable for the horse <laughs> was it is that what the that Back chamber in was 1840 oh, right. when the house was built yeah the front house so e stables. before emt plates were invented each each studio had its own echo chamber um and again, you could patch between them. So if you were doing a mix in here, you could use number one or number two chamber. You could have four plates and four chambers if no one else. And very often you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, effects wise, all you had was plates, chambers and um, and tape echo and mm. tapes going, you know, on very speed and and that when, kind of thing. And when you think about how much is written on the Internet about the merits of different mic preamps you know I was saying earlier I, don't, I didn't even know the word mic preamp for the first 10 years of my career because you just turned it up on the top of the desk didn't you, you know, that's right that, yeah. you just used what was in the desk and you <laughs> used the desk I mean yeah. you either went to that studio or what you made yeah. the record you made had the sound of that desk mm. you know and I'm still a great believer in that actually I don't like using loads of external amps. gear and no. external amps and you know you've got to have a neve on your guitar and you've got to have a uh, um, a focus right on your bass drum. Well, I find it a distraction. I don't know about you. You, you sort of, you know, you, there's more chance of cocking it up if you've got yeah. millions of things plugged and in. Losing it. And that kind of summing thing. mixing as well. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plugging lots of things in. But but then you don't, and then you come to mix it and everything's all different. Everything is all yeah. got a different colour, you yeah. know. Whereas if you record it Coherence. all on an SSL, it's a lot easier to mix because it's all got a uh, unified the glue is there really is the yeah. sound of the SSL or the sound of the Neve or something or the sound of the TG whatever that is <laughs> well, it sounds pretty good we it? hated TG mixers did you We're really so glad to get rid of them yeah they're absolute shit they are <laughs> has anyone, no has anyone ever done a session has anyone ever made a record on a TG well I did I worked on Mike Edges a whole well. record <laughs> Mike Edges had one in his studio in, oh yeah in yeah France, which, yeah that's know, right yeah. he sold for that Two million good, I think. But uh, yeah. I did a set. I did a couple of sessions with him on, on that. I thought it sounded great. And yeah. So, but compared with the most of the desks, I was you know the Amex and things that I was freelancing and using in, in those yeah. days. When you know we put a tape on, and I turned the limiter on on every channel because oh, that sounds great. Oh, that sounds great. I was <laughs> limiting everything like crazy. Yeah, because it does. And I pressed stop, and it went. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and the little needle goes up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. But no, I do, I, do, I think we. We actually secretly hated the the TG desk, probably because it sounded good without doing anything to it. And what we wanted to do in the seventies was do stuff. A, do stuff, have lots of fiddling and EQ, and you know, being able to select, have a parametric. I remember getting an Oban parametric, 
and thinking, fuck, look, you can change the shape and all yeah. this, and there was all this little, yeah. which on a TG you can't do. I mean, it's, and just, it's just bass and treble, really, which is the beauty of it, I mm. think, and why people like it, and the fact that it sounds great going straight through. But it, at the time, when we you got the Neve toys. disc in, it was just like a, a <coughs> dream, you know, because you could do all sorts of things, you know. Yeah. Um, but having said that, one thing about the, the TG that we used to do is you could go, not on that desk, but on the, the wraparound desk where you've got these primary and secondary functions. I don't know if you know that. Um, the, the channel select thing, if it's um, when it's on primary, you route to your main faders. So if you've got 16, or I think it's only 16, isn't it? 16 <coughs> main faders, although they're all identical, um, so if you've got a mic on channel one, you could either route it to primary one, which was track one, going through the group, or secondary one went straight to tape, straight to the output with no going through it. But mm. what you could do, I don't know how many channels would be on the desk, 20 or 48 channels, you could go from one to the other to the other to the other. So if you wanted more <laughs> EQ, you just routed it to there and routed that one to there and that one to there. And, there. and you could actually take a signal and go through every single uh, channel on the desk, and if they're all at unity gain, when you got to the end, it should be the same. Mm. And it was. Mm. There was hardly any um, loss or noise well, build-up yeah, or anything. Military spec build, weren't they? Military there? spec, yeah. If everything was unity gain, you could go from one to the other and to the other, and come out the other end, and it was pretty much the same as what you were putting into it. Yeah. Yeah. And now the. The red desk, of course, was completely the opposite. It was always, <laughs> you know, it had bare board because it was valve and yeah. stuff. It all depend on what level you were driving into it, and uh, probably because they were old and, you know, they weren't um, up to spec and things. So, um, so you never really knew what you were doing with a, a red desk. You didn't know what was going on. But really. they they'd gone pretty much by the time you got here, or did you? Yeah, no, they were they were just in tape copying rooms, right? Really, okay. What we used to call tape copying rooms. Oh, so Steve right. Trainer, and there was a room upstairs that a guy called Dave Pickett had, which was the mock stereo room, which is where you did. Oh yeah. Uh, artificial simulated, yeah. simulated oh, how was stereo. That what was the, what was the trick then? What did you do? It well, it'd have a stereo plate, so everything was a bit more a bit reverb. reverb. <laughs> a bit more, everything was because you know, used to be, yeah, mock stereo. Yeah, a lot of my parents' records will say artificially artificial, enhanced yeah. to be stereo. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it was a bit of a reverb. That was it, a bit of a reverb. And Did they EQ um, one side different from it because, yeah, I think anything there was a, really. I think I've got is it a, a seven inch of She Loves You or something like that, which has got like more stereo, it's very trebly on one side and very bassy on the other side. That's probably what it is, yeah, or something trying to like anything that. that would make it sound stereo because yeah. they they had to sell it stereo you know if yeah, they yeah, yeah. if they were on the record that it was stereo yeah. and you played it back and it was mono it's like hey, hang on a minute yeah. you know you take it back to take it to court yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and then, of course they were making more money you know because they were selling the same mix yeah. bodged up as stereo mm. and getting twice as much money for it yeah. <laughs> that's what everyone was hoping to do with 5.1 weren't they yeah, yeah 5.1 <laughs> yeah didn't really um, happen though no, and then then quadraphonic came in. So mm. all these rooms, even the the old when the Neve desk come in, it was a quadraphonic room with four speakers, four JBLs in each corner, not five and a sub or anything. It was just four mm. identical speakers, and they built room four, <coughs> which is down the corridor next to two, because two was quadraphonic as well, and the room down um, number four was the quadraphonic remix room. So again, it was four JBLs with a TG desk and. Someone had built some joystick panners and other stuff. Um, and you'd do mixes, you know, like Alan Parsons would mix Dark Side of the Moon in quad. And There must know, be loads like, in the archives of quad mixes that, you know, should have come out on SACD yeah. or something, which I'd love to hear. You yeah, know. yeah. And you'd do two versions. You'd do uh, what was called Discrete, which was mixed down to one inch four track, which always sounded fantastic mm. because it was four individual channels. And what was called SQ encoded, which was, I think, a CBS, Sony CBS uh, encoding <coughs> thing, so that they could play back four channels from a stereo disc, as it yeah. were, you know, I don't know how it was encoded or something. And so every time you did a quadraphonic mix, you'd copy it discrete, but also do an SQ one, and you could monitor SQ. And it was absolutely awful because. <laughs> As soon as you switch to the output of the decoder, it would just go mono over your head, and anything that was centre back disappeared, so you couldn't put anything centre back. 
and so if you pan something round as mm. it as it went centre back, it would just disappear and Phase come back again. Cells, um, so it was always a bit of big disappointment because you knew when you did a quadraphonic mix, no one no one was going to hear it except you in that room. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's often true with five point one. You, unless you're in the sweet spot, if, yeah. Uh, unless you were there, it was a quad mix of tubular bells as well but you, yeah. whenever you talk to anybody involved with those or you know that was oh no it was, wasn't very good <laughs> so, it's like, well, it doesn't matter if it wasn't very good i'd still love to hear it you know just yeah, from yeah. A historical sort of perspective of, yeah. you know what they were thinking however bonkers it is i'd love to hear it you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they, i think they've missed a the trick a bit by not reaching yeah. all those it's, yeah uh, i'm sure they will at some time don't doubt yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, should, should we invite questions, Mike, or what do you want to... What, what, what do you think about remixing the Beatles, for example, and classic records? Do you think they should be in some ways as left as they are, or do you think... That well, they are left. Uh, they're, they're left. Uh, that's in addition to being left as they are, aren't they? This, yeah. like, so you've still got the choice of listening Indeed. to the, yes. the old version, as it were. <laughs> Maybe rephrase it. Do you enjoy listening to the remix? Uh, out of curiosity, yeah, I don't think I... Um, I don't think I'd go. I'd, I'd I'd say they're better or worse, really. I mean, it's great that Giles is doing yeah. it, and not some other really guy good. who's yeah. not connected. You know, I mean, everyone's very, um, you know, very precious about it, and I, you know, doing the right thing really. It's great. It's great. Yeah. I don't know about other bands. I mean, we're talking <coughs> Giles and the Beatles. I mean, does anyone remix the Stones? Has anyone remix Satisfaction? I don't know. They've still got the multi-track. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Lou Goldham's got Andrew Lou Goldham covered in Columbia. Oh, Five point one mix by Andrew Lou Goldham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. Greg Paddy did. Uh, Elton he, he did a lot of Elton John ones, didn't he? Yeah. yeah Gus but, should have done that, really. Well, yeah. yeah. Gus did all the mixing for Elton John. Elton was never there. Gus did it on his own. He would have told you that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> It's a question. Yeah. Yes. So, John, you mentioned um, putting, you know, vocals through a lovely speaker and those types of things. What types of things, as an engineer, would you consider are your creative moments? My creative moments. Yeah. <laughs> the highlights. Every moment's creative. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really don't know. I can't really say that because, you know. Um, well, I've asked a lot of engineers that question, and Ken Scott mentioned about when. He was working on a session and he had to be able to suspend the microphone inside the drum. Oh, yeah. He got into the habit of making it without the front head on, but the drummer at the time couldn't play. So he had to figure out a way of suspending the microphone in the drum and oh, yeah. doing it that way. Is there anything that you can think of that you've done? When did you feel most pleased with yourself? <laughs> my, my, I felt most pleased with myself, and I, I'm always, I still say, it is, is XTC the Dukes of Stratosphere, which was is a record by by XTC, and they called themselves the Dukes of Stratosphere because they wanted to do like a 60s psychedelic record. And we went in the studio. We did six tracks. I don't think the songs were written, and in two two weeks, twelve days, mm. we didn't we Tony engineer some of that. Um, no, I don't think. Did you do some of that, Tony? No, oh, no, no Tony it wasn't yeah. there. Um, and we went to Chapel Lane, Chapel Lane Studios ah, right. up in, in Hereford, which yeah. was great. And yeah. were there for two weeks and did this great record that um, we, what can I say, Kitchen Sink was on it and everything else, you know. Um, so you were just using lots of 60s techniques or, I mean, did that... Was it kind of a, a case of revisiting? It, it was on twenty-four track, but it was it went all the way through from the guitar sound to the drum yeah. sound and everything else. But and also the mix was totally screwed up as well. Yeah. You know, there was nothing flat about it. No. really, when it comes to the mix, because was it the fact that you were kind of just doing it for the hell of it, and they were kind of in a position where they could do what they like and yeah. have a bit of a laugh? It was a great relief for them because yeah. they were under a lot of pressure from Virgin to come up with a hit single. Right, right. Because that's right. the big thing. I mean, maybe it's different now. I don't know, but you know, making records in 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 those days, in the eighties, nineties, and two thousands, before streaming and everything else took over, you're always after the hit single. You're always chasing. The I'm hit sure single, still are, whether yeah. The, yeah, I'm sure they are, yeah. but much more than you know the record company, you know. And if the band could do a great album, and mm. if there wasn't a hit single, if there wasn't four hit singles, they were dropped and they mm. were out. Mm. 
so and that had a lot to do with the recording really you know you were much more mm. uh, so, so how, trying to make things great so they'd, mm. had they had enough hits then that they could warrant going and having a bit of a laugh and doing the Dukes of Stratosphere <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> they, of, they, they never kind of, had enough they'd hits, recouped yeah. and they were like they never recouped no I didn't think <laughs> it, didn't they? <laughs> they spent it all on videos nearly all bands in the 80s lost, yeah. never recouped because of the video costs mm. you know mm. And that used to come out of producer's fees. You had to sign in your contract. But, you you know, I always used to cross it out. And they'd say, they'd give you this big contract about how many how much royalties they were going to give mm. you. And right at the end, they'd say, no royalties will be paid until all recording and video costs are recoup. Mm. So, you know, you could bring your record in under budget. Yeah, yeah. And then you'd go off and spend half a million, half a million pounds on a video. Yeah. And so you'd never get anything. Well, you had, had SAFTA. Batting for you for that, yeah. didn't you? Well, yeah, you I'm just sure you'd, uh, you'd you'd be just onto that, wouldn't you? In the contract, you just cross it out, <laughs> and they don't know it. You know. <laughs> anyway, because when you went freelance, you—you, you, I mean, you were managed by Safter for a long time, weren't you? And he, and he was your sort of yeah main agent for yeah. But I was freelance for ten years before that. Yeah. When I left here, I left here in 1978. And one of the reasons I left here is because they wouldn't hire me out. So I was. Um, I was producing, well, I was a staff engineer here. I was producing bands like XTC and Bebop Deluxe and Magazine, the first Simple Minds album, all which I did in this room when it was around the other way. <laughs> and uh, I was still a staff engineer. So, you know, I was booking the studio. I used to think, you know, this is a job where they train you to be a client, mm. you know, because they train me to be a record producer and there I was coming back as a client mm. booking six weeks in Abbey Road you know I used to so those record those days you know you used to book six not six days but mm. six weeks you would book <laughs> seven days a week you'd be well, you couldn't here. do the vocals in your spare bedroom then could you no you, you couldn't be no. here still that's yeah. right so yes I'd, I'd book these I'd book I'd do various albums here for over a period of three years really and uh, it came, they, the, the Virgin, I was doing a lot of work for Virgin and they opened the townhouse and they wanted me to do XTC, which was a Virgin band at the townhouse. And so I went to Ken Townsend and said, hey, you know, that band that I was, you know, did the record in three last year, they, they, they want me to do it at their, their studio. He said, you can't do it, you can't do it. You're, you're booked to, you know, you work for EMI, you don't work for Virgin. And I'm going, yeah, but they'll... Um, they pay for me so I went back to Virgin they said that's stupid just whatever you cost you know we'll tell them ask them what your fee is you know what your 200 pounds a day this is in 1978 you know yeah. and they still said no and they still said no if you if you go off and do that record you can work for an EMI band at another studio and you can bring other ba other record company bands to Abbey Road but you can't work for another band at another studio I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, why not? <laughs> and then I went to Manchester, what used to be Manchester Square to see if they could make me into an A&R man or a house producer because we had the house producers in those days. And very often you'd get a band would come in and you'd be the engineer and the EMI house producer wouldn't turn up. So I mean, in a way, that's how I learned to produce was because I would be doing sessions, albums, albums, like all the recording, all the mixing and everything with no producer. And I was just the engineer, and that's that's how I learned what to do, really. Mm. Um, so yeah, they so that's when I left, really, and I was on my own. You know, I didn't want to leave. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it seems funny now in this day and age that they they were, didn't allow to yeah. hire me out. You know, yeah. and the day I I'm not going to both go on about this, but I had three albums in the top thirty and a top twenty single that I'd engineered and produced on the day I left. You know, I had the adverts and. XTC and Bebop Deluxe albums and an advert single, Top of the Pops, you know. It's like, no, we don't need you anymore. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Was that all right, Mike? That was fantastic. That's brilliant. Is that the sort What's of it? thing you wanted? <laughs> I was playing some uh, Zoe Harper records, which you produced. Oh, yeah. Great sounding records. That was done in here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Roy Harper.